Okay, good afternoon and uh, welcome. We are here to talk about community shares. Um, we're not going to go into um, a very high degree of detail around community shares because we've done that previously. However, uh, we will give you um, some of the key points to consider. So um, I should start by introducing myself. My name is Mark Holmes. I'm the community shares manager at Crowdfunder. And we've got with us today Dave Boyle from the community shares company. Um, our resident expert on community shares. So um, we thought what would be useful, given that there's lots of stories in the news around um, community um, organizations closing down, funding cuts from uh, local authorities and things, that, that heritage projects are, are particularly gonna be uh, prone to these sorts of funding cuts. So we'll do a, a short introduction to how community shares could work and some of the key considerations from Dave and then we'll enable everyone to ask any questions that they may have. So if you want to tweet those in to us at uh, Crowdfunder UK or use the hashtag, uh, so hashtag CFcomshares, and, uh, and then we will we'll get underway. So Dave, I think I should just hand over to you for a bit of an introduction. Okay, thanks very much, Mark, and hello, everybody. Um, as Mark said, we're not going to touch on, on the specifics of community shares. Um, there are lots of resources available on that. We can cover your questions if you have them um, as they come up throughout this broadcast. But um, some of the things I just wanted to put in front of people when you're thinking about community shares for a heritage project, um, they're, quite, they're, they're often the case with heritage projects that things like lease length is a critical issue. Um, a lot of community shares are taking place in place, things like pubs, where you're buying the freehold to the site. It's yours and it will be yours to do with forever. You can borrow against it. With a heritage building, there's probably some degree of conveyance of the building into a public or charitable body, which has essentially uh, been given this, this asset, the land, the building, to hold it in trust for the, for the, for the wider community, for the public benefit. And although it might not be in a great shape at the moment, your ability to use that building, you know, they're going to be nervous about giving it to a community-based group. Um, you know, there is a degree of, um, I think, uh, unfair uh, negativity about community groups from many of the more long-standing bodies which have been involved in, in owning and operating heritage buildings, particularly local authorities. Now, the lease length is important because it defines the security you'll have over your over your project. So if you're going to be doing, let's say you're going to be getting a building relatively cheaply, but it needs an awful lot of work on it to bring it back into a state where the public can use it, um, and you're going to be paying for a lot of that through grants and community shares, perhaps making up the difference, um, then the difficulty you'll have is that you'll do all of that work and then if the building can be taken off you in five to ten years time, then that leaves you in a bit of a quandary because you're going to be taking all the risk but at the end the worst thing that can happen for the people who own the building outright the freeholders is that somebody else pays for a piece of work what they would normally have to do themselves which is a great deal for them not so great a deal for you that matters because the length of lease will also determine whether you'll be able to get a mortgage or any other borrowing secured against the property and that helps with things like share liquidity um, with shares, one of the things you're trying to do is to say to people that over a certain period of time, we'll be able to return some of the investment to you, um, depending on our trading performance. Now, if you've not got a long uh, security of tenure, your trading performance is, is something you can't really guarantee past a certain point. So your ability to trade sustainably for the next 10 to 15 years is at risk. Second thing it does is means that if, you, if you've got a great project, it's going fine, but you just want to swap out your equity investors for some debt. Maybe you want to uh, extend your borrowings to do some more renovation or to expand the facilities. If you've not got a long lease, you're in trouble. You've really got nothing you can offer to anybody. So think a, a lot about the, the lease. The other big issue which comes up with heritage projects um, is essentially the ongoing business model. Um, a lot of heritage projects, and I speak, I'm speak. i speaking now in terms of broad brush pastiche, a lot of heritage projects are conceived on the basis that a building is really nice to look at or has a historic value because of something involved in its former usage or its architecture or its construction. Um, and 
they're great to look at they have great value but they're essentially very big library books rather than actual utilizable buildings and it's one thing getting the money to get the building into a state which enables you to use it to make it open to the public for for the heritage value to be fully realized it's quite another thing to have a business plan which enables you to keep up with the maintenance support any finance you've taken on board um, and a lot of people start with a resolutely not-for-profit approach and whilst that's entirely understandable the downside of that is that if you're going for a good year is not for profit then a bad year is less than profit which is to say losing money and um, one of the things which needs to be really thought through is how do you actually guarantee you're going to have the money in five years time this is one of the big risks underpinning a lot of the heritage funding which is available still is they've been burnt too many times from seeing great plans and great projects which in three years time they close because they just don't have the footfall um, and that takes into one of the final tips but before we move on to your questions really is is the issue of gauging the real support in the community for what you're doing and this is where crowdfunding more generally might come in lots of people doing heritage projects um, have lots of things they have to do and spend money on you've probably got to get building surveys done you've probably got to get construction plans project management plans put in place to, to you know how much is it going to cost to do the work we're going to need to do how are we going to actually manage that over a period of time all of this costs money and whilst many groups are able to deploy some goodwill from people who who are very supportive of what they're trying to do um, there's nothing like having some of your own resources to actually make this happen and you can apply for small grants but that's getting increasingly difficult given the wider financial position um, and there's lots of people looking to do this as mark says with councils who are the owners of a great many heritage assets looking to move them on because they simply don't have the funds so it's getting to be a quite uh, a crowded marketplace um, and one of the ways in which you can actually raise money in in the short term is through basic crowdfunding which does another thing which is really helpful is it starts your process of engagement with your community who will become your community share investors and it also gives you some real validation that that these things normally start with a small bunch of people who for whom a particular building really matters they love it maybe they love the style of architecture maybe they live very close by and they can't they want to see it in full use the next step is to find out is it just four five six seven eight people or is there a wider community group and then beyond that is there a real wide community support or are we essentially the only 25 people who really care about this building are the people on the steering group to save the building and everybody else whilst they'd like it to be around it's not something they're really going to be wasting much time thinking about they've got bigger things to worry about in their lives so finding out what's the depth of your support is a critical thing and at the same time if you've got financial needs a small bit of crowdfunding to really kickstart your project will be something you should a lot of groups should think about because it will save you um, an awful lot of time applying for for grants which if you get the grant it's still soul destroying and if you don't get the grant it's heartbreaking and soul destroying um, and and there's a there is a better um, and more useful way you can raise the similar sums of money um, which give you a, a real sort of insight into how how much traction your idea has yeah I think it's worth me just saying that we've found that, that crowdfunding using using rewards in particular through our platform has been a really good um, as Dave said, a test case of the of who your crowd will be that's going to fund your wider offer, but actually to check that interest level and backing, uh, and it's really quite simple to set up uh, while you're doing the other work required to to get to the point of being able, able to offer shares. Uh, just remind everyone to uh, to send their questions on on Twitter using the hashtag #CFComShares. Uh, we've had our first couple of questions come in. Uh, first one being uh, quite timely and, and as you'd expect Dave is around examples of other projects that have, that have used community shares as of other heritage projects that, that we're aware of that have, that have used um, community shares I suppose the biggest uh, and most prominent one being maybe Hastings Pier would you suggest? Yeah, yeah Hastings Pier is one of the, the, the poster children of community shares in, uh, uh, in, in this space um, like many a pier um, it had heritage value. It was the first peer in G uh, Eugenius Birch um, did in the UK, and like a lot of peers, it had fallen upon hard times. And again, sadly, like an awful lot of peers, it had fallen um, into being burnt down. Um, funny that. 
So, so her, the actual value to, to reinstate the peer um, was an astronomically large sum of money, which was funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, about, around, um, I believe it was around 13 million pounds. It was, uh, it was from their national fund rather than their regional funds. Um, but they needed a shortfall uh, to be covered they, because construction, um, there's always things you find out which you didn't realize at the time. And as much as you can prepare contingencies, there's a risk. But the critical thing they wanted to build at Hastings was, was, was uh, an engaged community of users because this peer would only work if over time they could increase the number of people who, who wanted to support the peer, not just vicariously, but actively using the peer and the facilities placed on top of the peer. It wasn't enough to get a load of money from the lottery to then get some money to renovate a building, which if it didn't get the usage in 10 years time would similarly be in need of a massive six, seven figure, some cash injection to make good the maintenance of it. So it was about building an engaged community of users for when the pier had been renovated. So they raised um, 590,000 pounds back in 2013, 14. And, and this has enabled them to complete the pier, which opens um, in around about five to six weeks. And I saw a flyover um, of a drone over the pier and it looked absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it's gonna be a, uh, an amazing thing when it opens. But then, you know, they've, they've, they're gonna have to probably do more share issues because working capital is always an issue for heritage assets. Hastings Pier didn't offer, uh, it, it's, it's hoping to offer 3% um, interest to its investors uh, with withdrawal dependent upon trading performance. Um, and to some extent that creates a virtuous circle. How do those people who are investors get their money back, if at all? Well, they get it back because Hastings Pier gets used and is generating a clear surplus, which they can think, well, we've paid for the maintenance, now we've got some funds left over and we can support our investors and say, thank you, you enabled us to give our town back its pride. And like a lot of heritage projects, Hastings Pier might have looked like you're investing in some Victorian ironwork and woodwork, but actually you're investing in the identity of Hastings as a community. Are our best days behind us? And that pier is a visible reminder that it used to be better around here. Or can we make this pier an icon for the 21st century, which says Hastings, the best is yet to come. That's a much bigger appeal than simply, do you like old Victorian walkways over the sea? Because if you don't, then the pier's not really got much to say to you. If, however, you live in a community and you want it to be better, then a share issue can mobilize those people who might not have realized the importance of the heritage asset to that broader community sort of perception. Um, the other uh, two which, which I'm familiar with, or most familiar with, uh, Clevedon Pier, very similar business model, it seems to me. Um, and like Hastings Pier, it was a charity, company limited by guarantee, which converted into being a charitable community benefit society in order to issue the share capital. Um, that was a similar route taken by Port Patrick Harbour, which is a 450 year old harbour in the uh, Dumfries and Galloway coast, which was owned by a, a, a standard charity, um, which which had basically run into bad ways and got the, the, got the, the entire asset had been lent, put in hock to some lenders who had lent the money on very generous terms in the hope that the charity would kind of, um, you know, it wasn't the worst thing in the world if they defaulted because they got access to some prime real estate in a, in a lovely picturesque fishing village. They raised a hundred thousand pounds in double quick time um, and and that's been augmented by some of the charitable funding there are also some heritage projects like unity hall in wakefield which is an old cooperative building which had been to, which has been repurposed into a uh, a community space again it's got wonderful architectural and historic um merit but it was about you know it was that that, that alone wasn't enough to sustain it and, and nor had it been enough to sustain it so they've got a different business plan about using it as a, as a as an event space. Okay, it's worth pointing out as well that on the uh, crowdfunder website there is uh, there are some success stories on there, and Hastings Peers is, is one of those with uh, a link through to their site and and a YouTube video and things. So it's worth checking that out and having a look. A um, couple of other questions that are starting to come in, Dave, and you've started to, to mention a couple of these things. Yeah. People saying they're sort of at the start of this journey, and they've just found out that they're their, their museum or their, their building might be in danger. Uh, yes. And really the question is, 
where do they start? And you've started to talk about some of the, the types of organizations. You've mentioned community benefit society and a yeah. charitable community benefit society, a co-op. So yeah. where do they sort of start is, is one of the questions. Um, well, the first thing is, is I would, you know, you should only ever incorporate and become something with a corporate personality when you need to. The main reasons you need to are either to get a bank account in order to hold a grant, um, or to do some feasibility work. These things often start with a feasibility study. Um, normally, a lot of councils will will um, want to know that your your eight there is a business plan, a viable future for this building. Um, a lot of fo large funding grants are absolutely contingent upon a successful feasibility study, which says. You know, essentially, these people are not a bunch of dreamers who can't accept the hard-nosed reality that this building is knackered and it's always going to be knackered, that there is actually a viable future for it and it might just become something amazing. You need to get that demonstrated. So commissioning a feasibility study tends to be one of the first acts. In terms of your legal structure, I would always tread carefully. Um, there's a rush to get, you know, because you think you should be a charity at the end because you'd want to own this as a charity. It may be a condition of you getting the, the rights to develop it, to renovate it, to run it or operate it, that you are a charitable body. Uh, but you need to be that charitable body right here, right now. You tend to need it by the time a lease is assigned to you, but that might be several years off. In the meantime, um, you being a charity, would, you, know, you might have uh, acted in haste and you can regret it at your leisure. Um, if you're thinking about doing community shares, the most obvious legal structure for you will be a charitable community benefit society, which is uh, a slightly weird beast, uh, which very few lawyers will talk to you about because basically they don't know much about it. And a lawyer would very rarely admit to you that they don't really know what they're talking about. So they'll pretend it doesn't exist rather than say to you, say to you that they don't know much about something in the law. Um, but there is information on, on places like Cooperatives UK site um, they're the only people I'm aware of who've got a charitable, um, and, and sorry, Wessex Community Assets have got charitable uh, model rules to register a society. But even then, you shouldn't probably be doing that until you're getting ready to the stage where you're looking to hold an asset and raise significant funding. In the meantime, the main thing you're looking to do from any legal structure you take on is essentially to protect yourselves and give yourselves limited liability for what you're needing to do. And in the main, I would strongly recommend forming yourself as a company limited by guarantee. It's the standard not-for-profit operating model in the UK. And it's very good, um, essentially, for, um, for small-scale groups who are looking to do things like get bank accounts and give themselves limited liability there'll be a point where you have to start thinking more seriously about what's the legal structure we would want for the next 10, 15, 25 years. And at that point, you because at that point, you start to make irrevocable decisions. Once you've become a charity, it's almost irrevocable. Um, you're stuck. And if you've done it because it seemed like the thing to do, then that's not a very good reason. There are very good reasons to incorporate um, and very good reasons to become charitable, but be mindful when you take them because they tend to create new realities which it's difficult to unpick and undo. And if you've gone down the wrong road, then then you know you've placed yourself in a bit of a quandary. Um, so think seriously about that. But um, in the main, the first step will always be for a group is to uh, probably get a bank account. Um, and you don't need to be a corporated body to do that. You can do so as an unincorporated association um, and get accounts with banks like the Nationwide who provide something called a treasurer's trust account. Various banks have similar things for not-for-profit community groups. Um, and, and be guided by the people you're engaged with as to what point you need to become incorporated and why. Um, if it's just because it's going to cover their backside in dealing with you, then, then you know, ask exactly how that particularly helps. Um, because normally you should be getting something like legal structure to cover your own backside, not to cover anybody else's. And if you're not being given actual responsibility for things, then I'd argue that maybe covering your own backside isn't the number one priority because you've not much to cover. Okay, so yeah, so there's lots of thought to be gone through before you, you start the journey and making sure yeah. it's the right thing. Yeah. Um, some of the other questions coming in, I think we've started to touch upon some of these, but and you, you said the key points around lease and, and, and yeah. you know, business models, but 
the questions coming around, you know, what what is the difference between or, or why are community shares better than some of the other methods for, for heritage projects or, or you know can be yeah okay well the two the two big diff the two big things you get from community shares um the first one is validation most grant programs have application processes which are to some extent designed to make you lose the will to live um one is a way of giving you a hurdle to clear um if you you know if you bulk of an application form you're probably going to bulk at a 10 million pound construction project um but the other thing they're trying to do is de-risk and one of the big things they're looking to do is to say if we give this project rather than that project the money um how do we know we're backing the right people who's likely to provide the greatest public benefit for the money we're giving them and one of the key factors there isn't just about the popularity or otherwise of the asset it's also about who's got a business model which gives us the idea that we might still be trading in 10 years time so they're not going to be coming back to us cap in hand and say you know sorry we gave it our best shot but it turned out that our business plan was incredibly um, as we say, aspirational which is to say completely bonkers and not based in reality and as a result, all that money you gave us to renovate this lovely asset has kind of gone down the swanee because we've not been able to do the maintenance for the last five years. So they're looking to de-risk who's likely to use the money wisest and longest. And to do and if you've got a like at Hastings Pier, if you've got an engaged community who are going to do several things, they're going to be your future customers. They're going to be your future advocates. They're going to be not just using it themselves. They're going to be the marketing advocates in the community and beyond, pressing people to come and visit your asset because it's great and because they own a stake in it. They literally own a piece of it, and that's what's changed the relationship. You know, it's no longer a vicarious thing. There is a small bunch of the great and the good who really love that building, and I wish them the very best, but don't really ask me to take responsibility for it. I'll happily say it's great living in a community where we've got our museum back on, but don't ask me to do anything to actually make that museum happen. If that's something you want to deal with, then you you know you need to engage those people and give them a stake in what you're doing. Um, giving people that stake also underpins the governance of the organisation because not only are the the lottery funders or the heritage funders investing in the project and the building they're also investing in you as a group of people who can deliver the project as you say you can and can keep on delivering it and i think you know there is a there is a danger with a lot of heritage assets i think um that they become a small preserves plaything they're quite closed this is what happened with port patrick um and they became unaccountable for their decisions and having become unaccountable for their decisions they started to make not very good decisions for the long-term future of the peer and as a result, so the harbour, and as a result, got into financial difficulties, which threatened the very existence of it. So, some form of accountability is a is a is a check and balance, which can reassure funders. So that's what one of the advantages: the validation and the onward sustainability. The other big one, from your perspective, as people looking for funds, is that essentially the difference between a donation and a community share investment is around a zero, an extra order of magnitude. Research by Nesta um, and Cambridge University um, found that on average, the, the average donation into a project, be it rewards funding or donation funding, was around £50 per person because it comes from their day-to-day -day spending money. People who invest in community shares, if they didn't invest in community shares, they wouldn't spend it down the pub or on, on, on a new suite for their, for their living room. They would be keeping it in a cash ISA. Um, it's part of their savings, their rainy day funds. And as a result, the average for community shares is around £400 per person. Um, so whilst donations are the traditional method of doing this, you've got to make a cold-hearted calculation. How many 50 quids is it going to take to raise the kind of sums of money you need? And are there enough people who that ma matches up to who care enough in your community to actually be motivated to do it? Um, and that's where community shares... Um, really comes in because it gives you the benefit of extra income and it also creates engaged um, owners who are there to to be the most powerful advocates for your heritage asset going forward yeah so I think that that 
um, really makes sense with the you know the advocates and the ability to to have be, think, be in your own control as well. Uh, we've got a couple more questions that have come in. I'll just remind everyone that if they do have any questions, to use the hashtag CFComShares. Um, one of these is a bit of a how long's a piece of string question, Dave. Um, but someone's saying, you know, how long is the ideal duration to run a community share offer for? Uh, you know, can you run it over a long period of time? Uh, and yes. Uh, okay. So there's several questions in there. There's first things to say, there's two types of share offer. There's what's called a time bound offer, which is it opens on day X and closes on day Y. And one of the questions I think in there is how long should that period between the opening and the close be? There's also a kind of open offer, which is permanently available. You will take money on in capital investment from your community um, at any time under certain conditions. And those two are, are slightly different, well, they're very different things. Um, even though it's still the same thing, people buying investment shares in your enterprise. So when it comes down to the issue of how long should your offer run for, whilst obviously that's a function of how much you're looking to raise, um, in my experience, you should try and make it as short as is humanly possible for two reasons. The first is every crowdfunding issue has a, pro a profile of a U-shape. At the start of the offer, you get lots and lots of people really excited about this. These are your hardcore supporters who've been with you on your journey for, for, for as long as you've been on this journey. They love the building, they love the heritage asset, and they can't wait to contribute to it getting um, to the next stage. And then you move into the secondary, which is the real people who are not as necessarily as big fans of the, the asset as you might be. Um, and these people take longer to convert. So there's a period in the middle where the numbers tail off and it gets quite depressing. So if that's going to be the case, then my advice would be to don't depress yourself by having that U shape, that trough in the middle, to be as short as is humanly possible. So Hastings Pier, for example, raised £600,000 in six months. And in the middle of that, it was barely a trickle. If you think of it like a riverbed, which has dried up because the flows, there's not enough water to get anything beyond a trickle. Positive News, who were a share issue which uh, went on crowdfunder with our assistance, they raised £260,000, i.e. about just under 40% of what Hastings Pier did, but they did that in one month. And it's much more frantic, but it gives you momentum, and momentum is your friend, because you're trying to give people the sense that this is happening. This is a great share offer. It's on its way to being successful. Momentum is here and you should jump on the bandwagon because people like jumping on bandwagons. They're not as keen to start pushing bandwagons themselves. So if you've got an extraordinary long period between your open and close, um, one, it looks like you're hedging your bets and two, it looks like that to the outside world and, and you'll lose in terms of momentum. Um, the other factor in there, though, the sort of contrary factor, I'm saying there, make that as small as possible. What governs as possible? Well, it comes down to your resources as a group to campaign. Um, if you're having a share offer campaign on every single day, you need to be doing something which provides a new spin and a new way of saying the same thing, which is people, if you love this building or this asset, you're going to have to pay for it or else it won't happen. Now, that can be quite dull and repetitive, so you're finding new and interesting ways um, to say that so the local papers, the local media give you the kind of coverage, even though there's nothing news uh, where this actually happened. It's just the same people are saying the same thing, only this time they're wearing clown outfits or whatever it might be. So there's only so many bodies you can throw at the issue in your campaign. And if you're going to exhaust them because they don't work full time on this, so you can't really do it over 28 days because there's only weekends you've really got to be active on it, then that's something to think about. So it's about what resources you can throw at the campaign. But this is the bigger factor, really, than, than how long should the campaign run itself, is how long do you need leading up to the campaign to really engage people? And that's where a lot of projects not just in heritage, but they fall down on the level of engagement they do because they've often, for very good reasons, people have been so busy constructing building schedules, getting quotes for different bits of work, applying for grant funds, providing reports on how their grant's progressing, that they forgot to talk to the community of investors. And they've assumed that, you know, when the time comes, everybody will, will, will snap into place and they'll be providing money um, like there's no tomorrow and it just doesn't work like that if you need a certain amount of 
money from a certain number of people. You need to be engaging lots and lots of people in advance so they're excited about you. In the share offer campaign itself, you will not be convincing them that your project is viable. They already know it's viable. They're now just converting into the people who make it happen by giving you the money. If you're explaining about the project too much in the offer, then you're going to fail, and that's work you need to do in advance. So think of it like preparation for a sports team. You know, there's the match itself, which is really important, but there's also the preparation in the week leading up to it where you do all the training and the drilling. The same is true of any activity, really. It's about the preparation time, and that's, if not, as important, probably more important than the actual specific time period you put the offer length in. And to some extent, they're related. The more engagement you've done, the more excited your crowd of investors is, the shorter the period you will need to actually get them over the line because they're going to be absolutely gagging to invest. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things I'd, I'd add there as well. One of the, the functionalities we've added to Crowdfunder is the ability to have a register interest page. Um, so while you're doing that warming up, that, as Dave said, is so important, you can actually have a page there with some of the information and, and allow people to register interest and add their email address so you can go out to them then and, and when you are live and you've got all your ducks in a row, um, you can talk to them and say, you know, come back now, we're ready to take investment and, and here's the way to do it. So that, that warm up, that registration of interest um, can be going on while you're doing your building plans and all of those things that Dave just, just outlined. Uh, and, and warming up the crowd and also you can use the link in, in any Twitter messages, Facebook, emails out, uh, press releases as Dave said. So when you warm up that crowd you've got that ability to register interest which means you've got that crowd ready and then when the investment goes live they're there to put that investment in to begin with and, and build that momentum which Dave mentioned as being so key. Uh, the other thing I'd just pick up on um, is, is around the target you set as well. So you, you may have a minimum target that you have to reach to be able to do X, Y, and Z on the building or, or, or to get the lease. Um, but setting your target is really important and making sure it's achievable. And then you have the ability, so we've got a prototype at the moment, uh, Penicuic Stores on Crowdfunder, who, who set a realistic target that they needed to secure funding. And then once they've hit that, they've now gone on to overfund and, and, and increase their target to, to enable them to take on less debt. So if you set your target right, if you've got grants lined up, that can really help you with your messaging. I don't know how you feel about that, Dave. Yeah, the other thing to say is with most community share offers, either in the heritage world, um, what you want to be doing is either being the last piece of the jigsaw um, and if not that, the first piece of the jigsaw, and, and then if you can't be either of those two things, then you're going to have to work really hard to sell what the difference you're going to make. At the end of the day, what you're, the, the perfect offer is we've raised X million from all these bits of other funding, and the only bit missing is this amount here, and we think we can get that from you, our community of supporters, and if we get that, then this building reopens like we've been wanting it to be reopen for so long that last piece of the jigsaw is a really powerful motivator because you can say with your money this thing happens in the world this change is made in the world which you say you care about the first piece of the jigsaw is when you've got a building which maybe people think there's no business plan behind it which would be sustainable or people say it's lovely but you know does anybody really care that much about this um and if you're trying to demonstrate that there is a real community of interest who really believe in this project and they've got significant funds, then that can be a game changer too. It can make you much more attractive to grant funders who've, who've seen how strong the, the passion is for the project and, and the, the commitment people have shown in you as a group of activists. At the end of the day, you're going to be a smaller group of people who do this. And if you can get a thousand other people to say, we believe in you so much that we've given you an average 250 quid each. Um, there's another signal being sent to grant funders there, not just about the project, but about you as a group of people who can take this project forward. You've earned the trust of your community, so why should a grant office um, doubt that trust? Because you know you don't, these people don't know you like the community who've just given you significant funds. 
if you're in the middle where you're trying to raise money a bit like in those seaside horse races where they're all moving forward slightly like this that's very difficult because to some extent there's a, a an imperfect feedback loop because you're trying to say to someone with your 500 pounds your 250 pounds that goes to make some change happen if it's with your 250 pounds it puts us in a stronger position to apply for grants and then we apply for those and then we do the work and then the building opens it starts to be a longer chain of causality and the longer the chain of causality the less passionately and the less uh, salient the offer will be to individuals who are looking to invest okay and i think we've just got um two more questions that have come in so i'll just say again if you've got anything you'd like to ask use the hashtag cfcom shares um, and i think if we if we don't get any more in then we'll, we'll wrap up after these uh, but first one dave i think it's probably more you and the second one will be a bit of a joint thing for the two of us i think so um just had a question around um obviously people a little bit worried or, or, or unsure around the fact that um being a museum or something perhaps that they don't have a clear way of offering interest so there's people are asking you know what level of interest you, you reference people who are having savings in ices and things like that is there a you know obviously it'll be a case by case but any advice on interest um Interest should be, uh, the first thing to say is that the, one of the beauties of community shares is that the board are the people, unlike a loan where if you say I'm going to take a loan from, from you at 3% uh, interest, there's a legal contract being made between us there and if you don't give me 3%, then, then you've broken your side of the contract and that puts me in a stronger position. I've got rights I can exercise. With a community share investment, the, the ability to pay uh, interest is firstly capped in law. It can be no more than that required to attract the investment. So you, you can't make it a, this isn't a way to get rich. It's a way to add value to your community, but not to transfer value to your, to your investors. Um, secondly, you can only do it really if you're actually generating the surpluses. So if you're not making enough money to pay interest, you can't pay interest, nor can you support share withdrawal. So the first thing to say about the aspect, that puts you, sorry, in a good position as an enterprise, because to some extent, what you can pay back to your investors is contextual. It's dependent on how well you do. That gives you a second benefit in that the people who can help you do as well as you could possibly do are your investors themselves. So the people who can best help you get to the situation where you're able to afford to pay interest are the people who benefit from that interest being paid, which is a really nice virtuous circle, um, which, is, which, which is very beneficial. In terms of what you should be charging, the thing to remember is that we've got historically low interest rates um, at the moment. They've been hovering around 0.5% on average for cash ISAs. You don't have to work too hard to do better than the bank. Five, six, well, actually about eight years ago, banks were offering three and a half, four percent for ISAs. So that meant you had to work very hard just to be as good as the no risk option of putting it in a bank account. So this is a moment of opportunity for projects like Heritage and indeed anybody looking to do community shares. Um, and you, you know, there's, there's, you, you shouldn't need to break your bank, as it were, or break your backs trying to justify a, a rate of interest, which is super duper. Um, but the main thing it needs to be is accurate, and that's going to be dependent upon your business plan. Um, a lot of people, I think, it's not so much that they they struggle to see how they can pay interest; it's they struggle to see how they can turn a surplus from the activities, um, especially if there's always been an element of subsidy which they've received. Uh, the, the activities have achieved. So there needs to be a degree of imagination about how you might utilize your your community goodwill. In some cases, this might be that you're moving towards something which is staffed by volunteers or relies upon volunteers. So your costs are much lower, which means that you've got more money to play with. It might be that you get an awful lot of goodwill from people who start to use the facility more, and that gives you enhanced revenue projections than, than it has when it's been owned, say, by the council. Um, you'll have to get into the detail of, of that when you start thinking about your own business plan. Um, but I think as important, the thing to remember here is that if you are um, 
uh, a charity um, who's doing a share issue through a charitable community benefit society, you'll be able to claim social investment tax relief quite possibly. You might even be able to claim some of the other tax relief like enterprise investment scheme or seed enterprise investment scheme relief. These can offer significant tax breaks between 30 and 50% to your investors. So against that backdrop, if you invest in a project and you can write 30% of it off against tax, then to some extent, why are you offering interest to those investors? Because they're already getting a reasonable return thanks to the tax incentives which have been put in place by the government, successive governments, I should add. Um, against that backdrop, the key challenge is less interest, more withdrawal. How are you going to enable, let's say, between 5 and 10% of your investors each year a chance to withdraw their money? Um, if you take on £500,000 and you want to give 10% um, back, then you need to be clearing around £50,000 um, in, in, in reserves or you need to be moving, as I mentioned, about an open offer. If you've got a proposition which people continue to want to invest in, maybe you could have a kind of one out, one in policy um, in order that, that people who are wanting to become members and new investors their capital enables other people who lent you their money or something invested their money several years back who have now left the area and need it for other things they can be given their money back uh, but if, i'd be using the tax system wherever possible to to mitigate your need to provide interest which enables you to focus much more on the i think more important question not so much how much money will i get but how do i get my money back uh, which is, a, you know, that's that's a, a bigger question. Don't rely on that, though, because at the end of the day, you, there is a, a massive amount of philanthropy in a heritage project. A lot of people's return is to see this beautiful building, this beautiful facility, this historic site in use again for a new generation. So don't, you know, think that you have to be, be being competitive. And there is an element of philanthropic um, benefit people get from just having been pleased to allow their money to make a difference in the world, which matches their interests, their values and their, their, their aspirations. Um, but, but you should be thinking about how you can support withdrawal because somebody who's philanthropic in the first year, five years down the line, a lot might have changed in their life and their ability to be philanthropic might have been constrained a bit. So you need to be thinking about the sort of replacement of their capital with new people perhaps. Okay, thanks Dave. And the final question sort of brings us quite nicely round to, to sort of concluding. Uh, and the, the question is around, can you mix and match crowdfunding with more traditional sources? So I think it's probably worth me starting off by saying, and I often refer to crowdfunding as being like a digital version of the Blue Peter Totalizer. You sort of enables you to pull all of your uh, funds and all of your raise, ways of raising funds into one place that you can, you can pr publicly show. So, um, you know, with the ability to add rewards, and, 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 on, and donations onto the crowdfunding platform, you can have that mix of community shares and more uh, and then rewards and donations. But also, as Dave said earlier, using rewards as, uh, um, or other crowdfunding mechanisms as a way of testing your crowd and getting you through those early development phases ahead of, um, of your application to more traditional funds that, are, as we say, is more competitive, but it gives you that ammunition there to say we've already had thousand two thousand three thousand people back us uh, and here's a list of those people um, and then using potentially community shares as a, as a final block in the in the wall so to speak and yeah. um, and and Dave quite right pointed out there the ironic in fact that the government increasing tax or enabling tax breaks to increase investment in these schemes when they've withdrawn the funds that have brought the requirement of, uh, of the funding in the first place but um, I think, as I say, that when we're looking at this, that it does take time and community shares are a great option for this. Um, however, it's a way of bringing it all together. You don't need to be one or the other. Um, yeah. The, the other thing to throw in is the, you know, who wouldn't try and get a big fat grant? Uh, it's free money, essentially, insofar as you don't have to repay it, though you obviously are committed to doing what's required. And that's, that, there is a thing here about heritage versus enterprise. Having been involved in a heritage project myself, there is a, a tension, which is in order to access heritage lottery funding, there needs to be a heritage educational dimension. It's not enough to say, we've got a beautiful looking old building, as you can see, 
you've got to have something in the building which educates the public who are going to visit it about that heritage and to understand it better. And that looks great when you're applying for funds. It's like, yeah, whatever it takes to get over the line. What that kind of does, though, is commits you to a kind of business model, which means it's not so much about using it. You know, you've created something with a bit of a school in it, um, and you can't charge for that school. So it, it is um, impacting upon your latitude for generating revenue because some amount of space is going to have to be set aside. And space is often at a premium, especially when it's cost to renovate it and bring it back into use. The Enterprise Lottery Fund for the Heritage Strand um, doesn't provide as much money, um, as far as I'm aware, unless there's been a significant change. Um, but um, it does mean that that you've got more flexibility about what you do. It's about living heritage, which is essentially a building which has something in it which respects and reflects that heritage rather than being something more sort of, you know, cast in aspic to some extent. So that, that's one thing to think through. The other aspect to your Bowie really is, is debt finance. Um, a lot of heritage projects struggle with this because they struggle to have a business plan which shows how they'll generate enough funds to support debt. Um, and that's worth thinking about because um, if you're genuinely struggling to show a business plan to support debt, then you might be struggling to support withdrawal from shares as well. And that you know, my alarm bell would start to ring at that point that you're setting yourselves up that a good year is where you only lose 10 grand and eventually you'll have a bad year and you'll lose a lot and then you'll be back at the very beginning of the cycle where you've essentially got to the end of what you were able to do with this asset. Um, so, you know, don't be afraid of debt. You don't have to take it on, but try and build a business plan which somebody would say, yeah, I'd lend you some money against this. Uh, because it looks like the revenue projections are sound, the assumptions are reasonable. Um, and that can often be the final part of the jigsaw where you can get some form of underwriting where you're looking to raise, let's say, a million pounds from the community, but you've got underwriting debt in place up to 500,000. So it goes back to Mark's point about overfunding. Your minimum there will be half a million pounds. But if you bust through that, then you've got the ability to have equity which is a more patient and cheaper form of finance in general um, and puts you more in the box seat and enables you to um, deleverage your debt which will probably be the better for you but that's the other element of the of the makeup of the package there'll also be some small donations which have been made especially if you are a charity and you've got charitable community benefit society status you will be eligible for gift aid um, like like a standard charity as well Okay, thanks very much, Dave. I think that's the, the end of our questions. It's worth me just pointing out a couple of things. It's, it's one, as we've talked about a few times, crowdfunding is a lot about momentum, so it's about warming your crowd as you go and keeping people informed and testing that crowd's there um, as you go. Crowdfunding creates advocates, which is key to, to all um, entities, but particularly around heritage, as Dave said, these would be the people who are, are not just coming to visit and, and putting their feet on the ground in the building but they'll be telling their friends and family and everyone else about it and and coming and and helping you become and, and remain sustainable uh, and and when you're crowdfunding that momentum aspect is key so keep people informed and sound them out use use your crowd as a test bed for what you want to achieve and then check it because they'll ultimately tell you whether you're on the right tracks or not and potentially save you a lot of time and, and money and and give you the confidence to move forward um, so in terms of summing up, really, I just say uh, thanks, Dave, for all your advice and, and help. There's, there's one more thing I'd just like to add, uh, Mark, which is I think, uh, you know, from, from experience working with heritage projects, um, there's often a very strong sense of stewardship which people are involved in trying to make these things happen. There is a genuine love for, for the assets they're, that they're, they're looking to bring back into usage. And people often get nervous about the idea of giving ownership over that to the wider community. Um, and the two things to say about that is, firstly, that sense of ownership is what is a game changer. Generally, everybody else has had a chance of owning these assets. Hastings Pier had been owned by the local council. It had been owned by a charitable trust, you know, the great and the good. Um, it had been owned for the people of Hastings, um, but it had never been owned by the people of Hastings. And it turned out that, that the chance to own it and say, that's mine, along with other people, obviously, is a really powerful factor. People like to own these kinds of iconic buildings. They liked, they've looked at them 
in many cases for all their lives and the chance to own a bit of it not own a brick with their name on it but to actually own a share in the enterprise which holds the freehold or holds the lease you know a brick can be knocked out a brick could be painted over but a legal sense of ownership is something which does motivate people and some community groups who are looking to do heritage they, they they're fearful of that they think but, but, but what if the community make the wrong decisions these are you know often very important heritage assets what they're really saying is they should be left to the likes of us and that's fine if you genuinely think that the wider community would make a complete rickets of it that's absolutely fine the trouble with that is though that that very community who you're slightly judging negatively are also the community who you're also going to be asking to invest and if if you're saying we like your money but not your voice that comes at a price and it's not a great look and secondly that community are also the people who are ultimately going to have to patronize your asset when it's up and running or else you're going to be a financial failure you're not going to be sustainable and so i think very clearly about that because there is an element of if you think that the community ownership route isn't the right way to go then you're thinking about well where else are we going to get this money from and a lot of people what they really want is a time machine to go back to the days before the financial crash when there were lots of money in the grant schemes and the grant and the lottery wasn't always being talked of as being raided by other parts of, of government um, we don't have that time machine we only have some pretty big choices ahead of us and people need to think seriously about if community ownership scares you um, what does that say about your project and also where else are you going to get the money from um, so you know that's that's kind of one of the you know it's a slightly challenging point but I think it's something I see more in the heritage sector than, than any other place so I think that you know a great opportunity but uh, you know a degree of work that's required to make sure it's the right option and and, and think it through yeah. thank, thank you Dave um, what I'd say is if this has um, hopefully answered some of your questions but we've not obviously had time to answer them all so if you want any further information have a look on the community shares section of the crowd from the website there's also a form there where you can um, just send us a little bit of information about your project that, that Dave and I can review and get back in touch with you and, and sort of arrange some next steps if that would be of interest. Uh, and also worth pointing out we have a, a, a community, another community webinar coming up on uh, pubs in, uh, in May. So um, let's see, Wednesday the 11th of May. Um, so you could register interest for that. Um, but in the meantime, we will share this webinar. Uh, we'll send it out. and. But please definitely don't hesitate to get in touch with us um, if you do have any questions around this. Um, we'll be more than happy to, to help or point you in the direction of someone that can. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Dave. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for everybody for joining us. Yeah, and uh, we hope it's been useful for you and look forward to hearing from you soon about your project. Uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day.